So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I am very happy to be here with you for Grand Rounds today, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Dr. David Henderson. Dr. Henderson is a longstanding colleague whose work I greatly admire, and I'm really pleased that he's with us here today. And of course, we were just reflecting. We'd rather all be in person, but very happy to have him here on our virtual Grand Rounds. Dr. Henderson currently serves as psychiatrist in chief at Boston Medical Center and professor and chair of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Henderson previously served as the director of the Chester M. Pierce MD Division of Global Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital, director of the MGH Schizophrenia Clinical and Research Program and medical director of the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma. Dr. Henderson serves as co-director of the NIMH T32 Boston University School of Medicine, Massachusetts General Hospital, Global Mental Health Clinical Research Fellowship. He's worked internationally for the past 25 years in resource limited settings and areas impacted by mass violence, disasters and complex emergencies. He's conducted research and training programs in Bosnia, Cambodia, East Timor, Ethiopia, Haiti, Liberia, New Orleans, New York City, Rwanda and Peru, South Africa, and Somaliland, among other places. His work has consisted of field studies, needs assessments, mental health policy development, and strategic planning, along with quantitative and qualitative surveys and mental health capacity building programs for specialized and primary health professionals, and also skill transfer program evaluation. In the United States, he's conducted more than 30 randomized clinical trials in severely mentally ill populations. And you can see why I'm very excited to welcome him here for his talk on health and mental health disparities. And with that, thank you so much and um, welcome. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Greenfield. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I had mentioned to my colleagues that um, it would be much better in person um, have a better interaction as opposed to me just looking at my slides and and a few names of people and stuff. But um, uh, but uh, you know we'll we'll uh, do what we can. Um, so this topic is of interest, uh, um, obviously with what's been happening in this country and, and around the world and stuff. But but also you know the the, the fact that we are you know, mental health professionals, we actually deal with disparities all the time. And so I'm going to do kind of a you know, uh, 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 talk with uh, that touches upon uh, several different areas of health and, and mental health disparities, uh, which I think are important, and certainly uh, some areas that that I have been um, involved with. And so, this is my um, disclosures: um, Synovian Pharmaceuticals on the DSMB board, and then uh, some funding uh, grants from um, NIMH, and including also the Global DSMB as well. Now, I, um, I like this slide um, because it, to start off because it's a, it's a reminder to me about um, how easily we pass judgment on things and, then, and, and those judgments can have significant consequences and really put people in boxes. So uh, this, this slide is I, I took in uh, when I was in my first trip to Liberia, uh, when I was at MGH uh, back in 2009 and um, I was in a restaurant um, um, up on, on a balcony um, and uh, meeting with some uh, WHO and UN um, uh, personnel um, talking about mental health in Liberia. Um, and I was watching this kid um, who basically um, took those rocks that you see in the middle of the road and he put them in the middle of the road. And it was an inter interesting discussion amongst my colleagues and all was I saying, you know, kid's a bad kid, you know, conduct disorder, why isn't he in school? Like a whole bunch of things. And I was just watching. And then I snapped the second picture um, and where the, the motorcycle guy, you know, came and saw the rocks and just went around and looked at the kid, basically saying, hey, what are you doing? Um, and, um, and went on his way. And I didn't snap the third picture, which would have been an SUV came by and saw the rocks in the road and um, stopped. And the kid comes running from behind a bush, um, picks up the rocks and move the, moves the rocks to the side of the road. And then he walks over to, um, uh, to the SUV and 
holds out his hand and he got paid. And so in essence, um, the kid created a toll booth. Um, and, and if you were to ask me, to, uh, you know, could you feed your family on 10 rocks a day? I would say absolutely not. But this kid figured out how to feed his family on 10 rocks a day. And everyone, you know, was pathologizing it. You know, this bad kid. And, and I was thinking, this is the kid I want working in our program. Uh, because, you know, it, it shows tremendous um, skill and strength and, and, and so on, creativity. Um, and it was survival. And so his behaviors were not that of, you know, he's a bad kid. It was like, it was, a, you know, somebody who's figured out how to survive and, and help his family survive. And so, so I just want to, you know, remind people that we have to be very, very careful when we pass these judgments on, on people, particularly when we don't understand them, we don't understand their culture, where they're from, what their life circumstances are, and so on. So we just have to be extremely careful in what we do. Now, I spent a lot of time in my career talking about and, and researching kind of the uh, medical comorbidities and schizophrenia and the mortality in schizophrenia. And obviously, you know, it, there's a number of areas um, of concern that reduces the life expectancy in patients with schizophrenia by up to 20 years. And so, and so it's really, um, you know, a very, very important area um, to pay attention to. And as you do know that, you know, there's lots of areas where patients with severe mental illness have higher risk compared to the general population. A number of um, um, chronic diseases, infectious diseases, um, um, and, and so on that are, our patients are at, at increased risk. So there's, so there's already some issues with, you know, health outcomes in patients with mental illness um, um, as well. Um, excuse me a second. Okay. And so when we look at, at some of this, we see that, you know, cardiovascular disease is, is an important area um, <coughs> where there's increased risk of uh, patients with mental illness. And, and the reasons for the increased risk, you know, they're less likely to be screened or treated for dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, and hypertension. And this is an important area because one of the things that like when I was at MGH, I did a study uh, with uh, pravastatin. And um, I was looking at the, you know, we had been studying inflammatory markers and inflammatory pathways in schizophrenia. And, and I was looking at a particular drug and turn, you know, or, or class of drugs, and then we landed on pravastatin to see if we could if we could improve inflammation with that result in a reduction in um, psychotic symptoms, positive symptoms in patients with schizophrenia. And we did the study, and, and um, but, but before we did the study, I actually had a very difficult time getting the study approved by the IRB. Um, and the reason was is they, they felt that, well, if the patient has hyperlipidemia, you know, someone we've consented to the study, we get the blood, blood tests and, and so on, and, and the labs come back and they represent hyperlipidemia, they, they should receive treatment for hyperlipid, hyperlipidemia and not be enrolled in the study. And I shot back that, well, what we'll do is that we will, we will I'll write a letter and we'll, and we'll send the lab results to their primary care doctor and then um, and, and help the patient schedule an appointment. And then if the patient, we'll bring the patient back in a month. And if the patient is not on a lipid lowering drug, we will enroll them in their study. And that way, you know, at least they have a 50% chance of getting a lipid uh, role drug. It was a placebo controlled trial. You know, it, it, and my point was, is that our patients are less likely, even when seen by P, their PCPs, even when the, their lipids are elevated, they're less likely to receive the staff or any treatment for, the, for hyperlipidemia. Um, and so the IRB agreed and we did the study, I think we was 40 patients and, and, and several of course had um, hyperlipidemia and we, we followed the procedure as outlined. And then by the time, and then we brought them back a month later and 
none of them were, had been placed on lipid, lipid lowering drug. And so we are able to randomize all of these patients into our um, study. So, you know, the bottom line is that um, our patients are less likely to receive these interventions and, 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 and PCPs and the health system can make all sorts of excuses for it, but it, but it continues um, 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 even, even today. Um, less likely to receive drug therapies such as the, uh, the thymolytics, aspirin, beta blockers, uh, post, uh, post-myocardial infarction, less likely to have premature, more likely to have premature mortality uh, post-myocardial infarction as well. And then one study uh, published by Ben Druss looked at Medicare patients and found that uh, patients uh, you know, following a myocardial infarction if they had any psychiatric disorder, they had a 19% increase in mortality. And if they have schizophrenia, there's a 34% increase in mortality. And the increased mortality was explained by measures of quality of care, um, not whether you know one, one MI was worse than another. It was actually this, the decision-making of the clinical teams um, uh, you know, which resulted in um, different outcomes. And so again, um, I spent a lot of my career focusing on that area, and 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 although I never knew I was doing disparities research, it turns out uh, um, uh, with that with that focus, that was actually uh, disparities research. Now, I'm shifting gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about um, you know what's been happening in the country and 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 it would, it with a you know big focus on health equity and and things that we really need to to think about. And if you, you you think about the you know the first thing is that you know what was so visible is to how the government and and the, the police forces and so on responded um, to uh, different events and so here you know in 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 in, in Michigan um, um, you know there's a protest about opening the economy and. And the, the police officers just, just stood and, and kind of, you know, people were yelling and screaming at them. But when there was a, a, a protest about racial justice, um, this is the lower picture is the, is the response um, to um, the, the protesters. So, so quite different um, a, approach. And so again, it just, just feeds into the, the systematic, systematic problems that we have um, on uh, in this country, particularly around uh, racial um, justice, and if you if, if you think about you know the impact of racism, you know it just it just impacts um, so many things, and um, you know there's you know there's overt and covert uh, racism um, that's happening all over the place, and you know we we went through a period of time um, with the previous. Uh, 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 Washington administration, um, where all of this stuff was a- acceptable, and that we're, we're still uh, having ling- lingering effects. Where you know it's quite acceptable to to um, do bad things, or say bad things to people, and, and so on. It became kind of the norm in the environment, but of course, you know, it impacts uh, uh, everyone physically and emotionally. Um, you know, that's that kind of short term and long term effects uh, can be quite uh, um, profound. Um, now, the, it's important also to point out that <coughs> um, our patients with mental illness um, are also at, at risk uh, for um, uh, inappropriate uh, treatment uh, by the law enforcement. And this is a a gentleman, I, I, I never even knew uh, that this was a common practice to put a bag over someone's head. And this, this patient actually died um, doing this, um, uh, this process. Um, and so, you know, so, so our patients are at risk, you know, patients with mental illness. And this person, I think in, in Philadelphia, um, they knew the person had mental illness. They had seen him hours before in the same day. Um, and um, he, he was uh, carrying a knife, um, but they chose to, to shoot him to death. And so patients with mental illness are at increased risk um, um, to, uh, to die at the hands of, of law enforcement. You know, it's uh, really uh, uh, unbelievable. 
And then you think about how many of our patients interact with the legal uh, system, the criminal justice system. Um, so with, with the nation, national estimates um, of, of, of the 11 million people admitted to the jails annually, about 2 million have serious mental illness. Um, that's a, a lot of people um, who are you know, entering the criminal justice system, oftentimes for very minor offenses and so on, but they end up staying there long-term simply because, for instance, they don't have money to, to post bail or resources to, to post bail and, and, and things like that. And so, 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 the, so the mental health system has become the de facto, uh, the jail system has become the de facto mental health system. And, and as you are aware, the patients are not um, uh, treated as well as they would be if they were in the community. Um, the, the interventions are uh, maybe um, um, not at state of the art. Um, um, and in, in, in some places, the, the interventions are just uh, downright terrible. And so uh, when our, our patients enter the criminal justice system, they are not treated um, quite well. Yet the criminal justice system is you know, one of our largest mental health treatment systems um, that we actually have. Um, and so uh, in the general population represents, uh, you know, 4% of people have serious mental illness. Um, in, in the jail population, it's 17% with serious mental illness and 72% have cold, of those have co-occurring um, uh, substance use uh, disorders. Um, and they, you know, they, you know, also have like a history of homelessness and, and chronic medical conditions um, um, as well. So really at, at significant risk. Now, there are a number of factors driving uh, these uh, crises. Uh, um, one is that, you know, disp disproportionately high rates of arrests, um, um, limited access to healthcare, longer stays in, in jail, um, high recidivism rates, um, low utilization of evidence-based practices in these in these uh, 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 jail systems, and more criminogenic uh, risk factors. And so these are some of the factors that um, uh, uh, play an important role. And you know, there's been really some good data that has uh, come out over the last few years. But here's one uh, talking about uh, detaining low-risk defendants even for just a few days is strongly correlated with higher rates of new criminal activity, <coughs> um, both during the pretrial period and years after the case disposition. And low risk defendants had a higher, 40% higher chance of committing new crimes uh, before trial when held two to three days compared to those held one day or less, and a 51% higher chance of committing a new crime in the next two years when held eight to 14 days compared to uh, one, one day or less. And so, um, so, so again, um, uh, you know, the, the, the point is, is that um, uh, patients uh, are at um, considerable risk um, and, and when they become involved in the criminal justice system um, and the longer they, they stay in jail, the, the greater their risk for um, uh, you know, future uh, offenses as well. Um, so, so really uh, um, important. Um, now, um, there are numerous challenges. First, law enforcement um, lacking alternatives to arrest and options uh, for, for crisis uh, re responses. Um, the courts lack diversion options and information to inform pretrial release. Uh, behavioral health uh, service capacity is scarce. It may not necessarily align with what works to help reduce recidivism. And uh, probation approaches are not always effective for people who have mental illness and the high rates of technical violations. And, and, and that's important too, this, you know, the, the technical violations, um, you know, patients will, will wind up back in jail for really, again, minor minor violations and uh, with little chance to, of getting out um, as well. And if you look at the, the jail population, we see, of course, there's, there's huge differences uh, ba based on um, ethnicity and, um, and, and uh, you know, and I, I think that's an, an important to recognize that certain populations, you know, higher risk 
and 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 overrepresented um, in 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 the jail system. And let's see. And, and this is looking at uh, Massachusetts. Um, and we see that both male and female, for males, the 31% of patients in, in jails um, have open, open mental health um, cases, 7% um, had serious mental illness, and 22% were on psychotropic medication. Um, and, um, and if you look at females, it's even, even higher, 79%. Um, had open mental health cases, 12% had serious mental illness, and 55% were on psychotropic medication. And so, um, so again, it's just uh, important to highlight the, the fact that uh, many of our patients are, are, are in the criminal justice system. And so um, there, there are four key measures that um, in, in system level changes that really need to come about. Uh, to you know, reduce the number of people who have mental illness booked into jails, shorten the length of stay in jails for uh, people who have mental illness, increase connection uh, to treatment for people who have mental illness, and and that's connection, um, really connection to health systems, uh, really really important, and then reduce recidiv recidivism rates for people who have mental illness, you know, really really important. Um, now one of the things that we've done. Um, at uh, at uh, Boston Medical Center, um, is that uh, you know people may be aware that we we run the uh, the best team, the Boston Emergency Services team, and and CEST, uh, which is Cambridge as well. And so, over the over the years, as a result of of the best team, we we developed other programs, including the Police Ride Along program, um, um, up into. Um, about a year ago, we had we had three clinicians um, available to the Boston police, um, and they would ride out with police officers. and And, and really, data showed that um, we reduced arrests um, in patients with mental illness by about seventy five percent on on those calls. Um, that, you know, developing alternatives to to be, patients being arrested. Um, we've since been able to expand that uh, program with a, a, a a grant from the city of Boston, um, where, whereby we have almost 20 clinicians now available. So every precinct has a mental health clinician that's available um, for to ride along with them um, with the police. And, I, and uh, so expanding of this program, I think, will have a, a significant in, impact. Um, we've um, developed a, uh, a mental health diversion um, uh, with the Boston uh, Municipal Court. So we have a um, you know, we work out of three uh, courts um, where we have a diversion program to, again, to reduce um, uh, arrest and, 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 and reduce the time patients are in jail. Um, we received a grant to do an outpatient assisted treatment program. And really it's important to, you know, people coming out of jail to uh, get them connected to health healthcare system um, in a way that I think is um, uh, um, you know, it, it, extremely important and, and can also reduce the risk of, of uh, being rearrested as well. And then we've, we've been piloting uh, several other projects, including um, I mean, as, as the country prepares for the new 988 um, um, uh, call system for mental health crises. Um, <coughs> We've been uh, working with the Boston police to, um, to connect um, th their system with, with the emergency services system, um, as well as having a, a, a mental health clinician um, in the 911 call system to, to, in order to uh, appropriately um, pick up on calls where uh, the, a mental health clinician needs to be um, involved. And so we're just piloting projects like that. But the big shift for us um, with the BEST program is, was to, number one, first establish a, a, a strong evaluation program for all of the um, 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 uh, projects that we have listed. But then also um, to, to have the ability to um, um, impact all of these systems um, uh, from a, uh, a lens of a, of, uh, a multiculturalism. 
So uh, BMC has um, a number of uh, a program called the Center for Multicultural Mental Health and has a multicultural psychology in, uh, internship and postdoc program that's been in, in existence for um, um, 50 years now. And so, so these are you know, experts in, in multiculturalism. So we're now taking this group and, and taking what their, their knowledge and experience and, and, and overlaying it on top of all of our, our, our services that, that are the emergency services, the, the court system, the police system, and so on, you know, with, with an effort to prevent some of the outcomes that, that uh, in those pictures that I showed you earlier. And so th this work is um, uh, in progress and, and, and we have a number of partners, uh, including the Boston school system as well. And they play a big role in, in all of these um, efforts. Um, and of course, you know, we have to acknowledge, um, you know, the impact of, of the health system and, um, uh, and uh, racism and, 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 you know, systemic racism and so on, its impact on our patients and, and our, how our patients um, interact with the health system and how they, you know, the, the type of treatment that they receive. And so, you know, it's important to acknowledge that. Um, and the biases, you know, it's, it's pervasive in science and beyond. You know, there's, you know, numerous um, 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 stories and publications um, on this. And, you know, it's just, uh, just in general, you, you, can, you, can, you can see this everywhere. And, it, and, and, you know, systems, you know, develop policies and procedures, uh, whether they're written or unwritten, um, that, that clearly have an impact on, on people uh, from uh, different backgrounds and so on. Like who do you decide to treat? Who do you let into your, your programs, your hospital? You know, one, one, one example, uh, which was, you know, pretty astonishing to me, uh, but um, um, here at BMC, um, like when, you know, BMC has a strong substance use program, particularly in opiates and, um, and, you know, at like most places, you know, you know, big volume through the emergency room and, and you know, with the mass and cast right, right on our campus, um, you see a lot of activity and a lot of people overdosing right in front of us, and so on. Um, but when we looked at uh, the data, we showed that like what comes through the emergency room re really represents the population of BMC, um, which is about um, uh, you know two thirds non-white. Um, but when we looked in our, um, our outpatient treatment programs, it um, for substance use, particularly for the opioids, across every just every department we looked at, it was two thirds white, and so um, you know one of the things we, we finally um, got the teams to do qualitative research and, and hear from our patients, and so um, the hospital had had adopt, adopted a strong harm reduction model, which is to give you know drug replacement like suboxone. Um, and, and so on. Um, but if you talk to the patients, our, our, particularly our, like our Black and, and Latino patients, they didn't want the pill, they wanted counseling, they wanted therapy. But the hospital didn't establish therapy interventions, they established the pill intervention. And so we, what we were providing is not what the population was actually requesting or, or willing to engage in. And so that really played with, you know, a big factor and uh, what we um, do, what we do, and just just to point out, though, you know, in, across medicine, um, you know, we 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 see that there's a striking loss of women and men from underrepresented backgrounds. You know, as you go, uh, you know, across from, um, you know, degrees up into your, you know, faculty careers and, and so on, um, and so so we have a problem in medicine in that we. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we do not have a diverse workforce. Um, and excuse me, the higher one goes, um, the the more difficult it is to to actually have um, that um, that workforce. Now, of course, um, there are things that can be done about it. it, and it's to say that you know this this most certainly exists, but it doesn't have to. 
Um, and there's there's solutions at, at all levels in order to in, in, increase uh, improve the diversity and 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 so on. Because the, you know, it, particularly in Boston, which is a very rich place for um, academia, uh, particularly in medicine and and, and and mental health and psychiatry is 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 uh, included in that. Um, and there's a lot of people from diverse backgrounds who are you know, experts in these areas that, that are around. Uh, but so it really is up to the institution to make the commitment um, to diversify um, the workforce. And, you know, and, and rightfully so, you know, the institution has to decide, decide is, is this important um, to us or not? So when we looked at BMC, um, we, I, we recognized that 70% uh, of our patients identified as people of color, uh, 36% African-American, 28% Hispanic or Latino. Um, um, so, you know, very diverse uh, ethnically, uh, culturally. Um, and also it points out that, you know, uh, people from 70 different countries come to the hospital every day. So extremely diverse population. But 50% have an annual household income below the federal poverty level. Um, and 30% use a primary language other than English. So it's a very diverse patient population. Um, and when we started to think about, okay, you know, how do we understand the, the disparities at our institution? Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we, we identified a whole bunch of things and I, I raised the issue about the use of restraints and, and um, you know, not surprisingly, um, you know, there, there's a reputation um, that uh, uh, black and brown individuals are restrained more um, in our emergency rooms than uh, white um, individuals. And so we, so we looked at the data and, and we saw, saw that there were significant differences. And we started to drill down on why, why is that? And, and one of the things is that um, oftentimes people are, were restrained before the mental health professional was even called. Um, and so something is happening at triage um, and we started examining and we're still in the process of examining the interaction between the triage systems and, and what we're doing um, uh, to that leads to uh, more black and brown people being put in restraints in comparison to uh, white patients. And so we're still working to um, ad address this, but, uh, but, but, but I can tell you that if you go to just about every emergency room, you probably see a very similar pattern. Um, and so again, this is the biases in, in these health systems. Um, and so everyone needs to look at this and to, um, um, uh, implement changes to to um, uh, get rid of this disparity. Um, and as you know, discrimination um, you know cuts across a whole bunch of population, but less likely to be hired, less likely to have apartments apartments rented to them, more likely to be rejected by friends and families, more likely to be falsely accused of a crime, more likely to be arrested and spend more time in jail than someone else uh, similarly charged. Now, <coughs> a couple of years ago, like prior to the pandemic, um, I had uh, an experience with the legal system myself, but although I was not arrested, um, but, but, uh, but just, uh, just an example, I was um, in uh, uh, the town next to me, I went to the supermarket, <coughs> Um, got my groceries, and then I was uh, putting, as I was putting my groceries into my trunk, I saw that there was a, a police car and a police officer had pulled over a young white male, um, and he, the police officer was searching uh, this young, young male's um, car, and I'm about, you know, maybe 15, 20 yards away uh, from them, and the officer must have called for backup because uh, a, another police, are, police car came flying into the parking lot and, and had a direct path towards the uh, other police car and the, and the young male that the officer was questioning. But 
somehow saw me, you know, putting my groceries into my into my car and deviated from his path to pull up the next next to my car. Um, I looked at him, he looked at me, and then he realized, like, what have I done? And then he then he just went around my car to to where the other police car was at. And I thought, you know, how powerful is that? That that like you could ignore a two or four ton car, you know, sitting directly in your eyesight with the lights flashing. And in, instead you see a, a black man, you know, with, with the trunk of his car open and that's where you go. And I thought, you know, this is this this really is, is something that that's quite powerful. And and this is why, you know, we started with our um our best and CES program to, to really bring a multicultural lens and, and, you know, we hope to impact the police to give them other, other options uh, when they're making decisions like that. Um, so, um, uh, so again, it's just, uh, you know, something to, to point out. Let me just see. Now, the other thing I want to point out, and this is uh, data, this data is not important other than, um, you know, in, in mental health care, um, there's disparities already that, that, that are um, um, selected and, you know, or, or, or led by the, the government and insurance companies. And so this just looks at uh, um, reimbursement per RVU uh, for, you know, um, a clinical interaction. And we can see of all the um, specialties Psychiatry is the lowest reimbursed, reimbursed per RVU. Um, you know, you know, and it's in it, and it's pretty remarkable that, like, you know, it, you know, is this you know per unit time? Like somebody determined, you know, it, you you spend this amount of time or whatever it is you deliver this service that you're going to be paid, you know, a third of what a dermatologist does for the same amount of time. Um, you're going to be paid less than you know the primary care doctor does, um, and, and so on. So it's, so it's pretty remarkable. Like you could have a family medicine doc who diagnoses depression, and they're going to get reimbursed more than the psychiatrist diagnosing depression and treating depression. You know, so so our, our whole system is built um, around this, and of course um, the, the COVID nineteen really um, played a. Uh, a, a, a role in highlighting the health disparities, but also in how people engage in the health system and in their trust of the health system, you know, really played out uh, um, with the COVID-19. And this is, this is just one example, um, you know, look, looking at the overrepresentation of um, African-Americans um, in our patients um, who uh, in the early phases of, of COVID, both in emissions, hospitalizations, and, and deaths as well. So now we know that um, you know uh, you know the, the notion that health equity is the absence of avoidable, unfair, but unremediable uh, differences in health outcomes among groups of people. Um, he relate to economic status, race and ethnicity, language, and and as I pointed out, behavioral health or mental health. Um, you know, it's right smack in there. Um, now we identified um, um, kind of a self-reinforcing journey for our black patients where we realized that we needed to intervene to, to kind of break the cycle. Um, so, you know, high prevalence requiring more outpatient care, poor experience, lower trust in, in system and feeling of disrespect more likely to, for, to no-show for outpatient care, lower screening rates and, and me medication adherence, greater need for inpatient care, worse inpatient experience, no follow-up or book prior to discharge, more likely to be re readmitted and higher uh, mortality. And so this, this cycle of things, and, but, but every juncture, there's an opportunity for interventions to improve outcomes. You know, and I, like, and I'm, I was always struck with the fact that, um, 
you know, this, you know, more likely to no show for outpatient care. And the notion was that there's a very high outpatient um, no show rate. Um, and, and I thought like, you know, particularly like, you know, having done a lot of global work, I thought like, if you're telling me that, you know, people from 70 different countries come to the hospital every day, how, how is it that we have one system and we expect everybody to line up and utilize the system in that way? You know, meaning like, you know, outpatient and you say you have a 1015 appointment. And if you arrive at, arrive at 1025, you will not be seen and blah, 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 and so on. Um, but everyone brings a different lens as to how they utilize our health systems and when to engage the system and so on. Um, like in some countries, people go and they, you know, they just show up and they, but they expect to be there all day and they bring their family and they bring their food and they, they sit and wait until they're, you know, they're called for their appointment and, and so on. And so, you know, which is a very different style. Like if you, if you did that here and you arrived like, you know, 30 minutes late or so on, you know, you, you can't just hang out and wait for an appointment. They, they tell you, you can't be seen, you have to reschedule. Um, and so, um, so anyway, so, so there's so many opportunities to bring about improvement, but we really have to talk to and ask our patients um, how to best help them to, to, to best understand uh, what the out, out, uh, outcomes were. Now, you know, BMC has been um, really um, in collaboration with other entities, uh, you know, uh, have been leaders in, in um, uh, developing kind of interventions to deal with health disparities, um, you, know, you know, getting out of the mindset of like, we're a hospital and we take care of patients um, you know, to, to more uh, start tackling some of the so social determinants of health. Uh, we have to be thinking about housing and employment and education and 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 and, and um, you know financial aspects and, and and so on in order to improve the health outcomes for our patients. And I think that's that's really where um, things are are, are headed. Um, that we you know traditional health health systems um, have to think out of the box and and think about. Um, those other factors that um, impact on, on their patients' um, health outcomes and, and how do we help or, or collaborate or partner with, with organizations, community organizations in order to address uh, some, of, some of those issues in order to get to better um, um, health outcomes. So it's, I think it's really, really important as to what we're, what we're doing. Um, but there, there, there are huge racial disparities in healthcare outcomes among Boston residents with mother and child. Black infant mortality is four times that of white infants in Boston. Um, the Black community has much higher prevalence of chronic conditions, usually like three times the rate of diabetes, um, two times uh, the rate of hypertension. Black uh, residents are 1.5 times more likely to suffer premature death from cancers. Uh, influenza, 1.4 times, and rates of STDs are four to five times higher in the Black communities. Um, black residents in behavioral health, 1.5 times more likely to suffer persistent sadness, and two times more likely to attempt suicide. And this is in Boston. Um, and, and you know that being said, um, there's probably, uh, those rates actually could be higher, uh, but we, we do know there's still a lack of routine screening. And even when health systems establish a, a screening for depression, say, um, you know, I, I, I had the opportunity to observe it at one primary practice. And it's fascinating how they approach patients about the, these screenings. And it's, 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 and it's, sometimes it was like, I know I'm going to ask you some strange questions. So, and I know you don't experience this, but have you ever, have you felt depressed or sad or, you know, you know, so they, they asked the one or two questions that they're supposed to ask, but they, <coughs> but they start with like, yeah, this is kind of silly questions or, 
well, I know you don't experience this, um, that sort of thing. And so you can imagine how easy patients will be influenced to say, no, no, I don't experience that. No, no, that's not a problem. Um, so, so we have a lot of work to do. Even when we've implemented screening, I don't think that we've, we've done training uh, well enough in order to, for the instruments to be used effectively. And then black residents in uh, Boston, more, five times more likely to experience homelessness. So, so we have a significant problem in the city of Boston where we have amazing healthcare. All of these factors are, are taking place. Um, so it really is uh, um, challenging. So in order to address the, the racial inequ inequities, requires action um, to address the drivers of health inequities within our hospital and in the community. So you can think about your hospital, but then you also have to think about the community as well. Um, and you have to factor in the social, economic, and, and, and cultural context of the disease burden, the bias in clinical decision-making, and the, and the negative patient experience. And the bias in clinical decision making is an area that we most definitely should be um, tackling. And if you think there's no bias in your health system on decision making right, that the impact uh, people from diverse backgrounds, um, you have to look closely at it, but I guarantee you, um, you'll find it. Um, and so you have to make it this part of the core hospital operations. And this is something we plan to do and we're working to do um, at BMC. And then it's the negative patient experience. Like um, um, if, you, if you do qualitative research and you ask patients, particularly black and brown patients, they, they talk about the negative experiences that they've had at health centers and health, health in, within health uh, systems as well. Um, so, um, so why are we not um, helping or, or why are we not delivering um, care to patients um, um, that that are positive and and um, and and um, um, helpful to patients. Uh, why why do they have or certain populations have more likely to have negative experiences? And so we really have to address that. And so so again, this was like kind of a talk that touched upon a bunch of things. But 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 as I pointed out, like disparity is everywhere. Like we. You know, we, we work, work in an environment of disparity but simply because we take care of people with mental illness and we, you know, struggle to get them what they need um, oftentimes and, and so on. But there's, and there's whole systems that pit it against them. And then, and then from diverse patient populations, there's, there's added levels of disparities that uh, impact um, care and outcomes. And then as health systems, though, we have to take a look at who we are and who we want to be. And, 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 and decide that. And if we want to be a place that cares for people um, who come from all over and can, give, can render the same experience for everyone, no matter what they look like and where they're from, um, then we have to take a close look at what we do and, and how we do it. And so, um, again, I think that's um, critically important. So I'm gonna end here and hopefully we have a time for a few questions and I, uh, thank you for your attention. Dr. Henderson, thank you for a um, really important presentation. Um, if people do have questions, I want you to type them into the Q&A box. We'll get through as many of them as we can. Um, I want to start, like, um, I want to start off with a question of my own. Um, you showed some data of the patient population at BMC and compared it to the patient population of very close by institutions, Brigham and Women's Hospital and Beth Israel Hospital. They are in pretty close proximity to each other. And yet the differences in patients that they serve are striking. And you made clear, uh, as most of us already kind of knew, that the health outcomes in those populations are dramatically different. And so, you know, on the surface, I can't help but wonder if we have a two-tier system like we used to have with education, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, black people go to one hospital system and white people go to another hospital system. 
And maybe they get very different levels of care based on funding or resources available at those systems. Um, and I guess I'm just curious as to your reaction to my reaction, but more importantly, what, what, are, what is it going to take to change this? They're, it's the same neighborhood. What do we have to do as a healthcare system to equalize this? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great uh, uh, question, Chris. I, I think that uh, there's just so many levels and layers to this that, um, um, you, know, I, you know, first, my, my first thought is that on, on, the, one, on the one side, like um, if you ask patients, particularly black patients or black and brown patients, they would tell you they're more comfortable coming to BMC in, in comparison to going to BI or, or, or the Brigham even though the Brigham may right be in their backyard. You know, it's, you know you're, all these communities are very, very close to each other. Um, so, so that's the one thing I, I think, you know, that, that's one factor. But the other factor is it's, it is finances. So as I pointed out, you know, you know there's differences in psychiatry reimbursement, but, but in fact, there are differences in hospital reimbursements. So... For instance, and, and, and I think there's legislature now um, that have been um, uh, working through the, the mass um, the state house to correct this, but the Blue Cross Blue Shield would pay the Brigham, let's say $50 more than they would pay BMC for the same service or $1,000 more, depending on if it's an interview, you know, whatever. So, you're delivering the same service, but we're getting paid less. And so, you know, but we're a safety net hospital, meaning we take in anyone, that, that sort of thing. And, and um, a large portion of our patient populations are Medicare or Medicaid. Um, so, that, so that also creates a, um, a, a huge uh, gap, financial gap, uh, because Medicare and Medicaid are the, the lowest reimbursed insurances. Um, you know, in comparison to, you know, uh, private com or commercial insurance and so on. So, so there's, there's huge issues around parity. There's no parity. Um, and and the, the one hospital in Boston that takes care of a large, um, diverse patient population, but also has the, the probably worst, it would call it the worst payer mix, um, meaning we're delivering the services uh, but but we are reimbursed so low. So, you know, the money is supposed to come in and go back into the system and you can develop, you know, excellent services and that sort of stuff. But we, you know, we have to develop excellent services without the resources. Um, so so it, it creates uh, quite a challenge, but, but it really is, it's, it's, it's complicated. And, um, but, but, but again, like I, I think, a big part of it is the patient experiences too. Um, you know, walking through the doors of an institution, if, if they feel comfortable, they feel comfortable. Um, if they don't, they don't. And, that's, and, that, and that is something that we have to, in this city, kind of break through uh, with all of the hospitals um, so that uh, patients could get care, you know, closer to home and, 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 and so on, so. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question, uh, great talk. I was struck by the 0% figure for Asians having physical restraints in the BMC ER. What do you make of that? This person says, as an Asian person, I'm wondering about model minority stereotyping. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. I think, I think one of the, th the things is that um, 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 BMC, um, serves a smaller uh, number of um, um, Asian patients than, say, compared to, to Black and, and Latino. But we do serve them. If you, if you go down, you know, a mile down the road, it's Tufts Medical Center right in, in Chinatown, and that, that serves a, a slightly higher percentage. Um, so that's one factor. But so the numbers aren't as big. But, 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 but in truth, um, you know, I think the, the person points out um, you know, there are stereotypes there as well. And so, and so the, the model 
minority stereotyping, you know, does play a factor. Um, and, and, and again, um, um, you know, like, you know, we're, we're just exploring what happens at triage and a lot of it is with the triage nurses and uh, or triage clinicians and, and so on. Um, and, and that first interaction and, and you know, it, within a minute or two, we can, we've seen that like patients feel disrespected um, and, and then they start advocating for their rights. And then, that, then that's a path towards restraints. And so there's, you know, and so uh, I think the, the stereotyping just plays out in, in real time often. Yeah. The, um, we probably have time for one more question. So I'm gonna combine the two questions that I see in front of me because I think they're both related. So one is what could McLean do to share the burden? But I think right along with that, what are systems that can be put in place to recruit, train, and retain diverse clinical staff and researchers so that they better represent the community and maybe help contribute to you know, people of color feeling more welcome in that treatment setting? Um, that's a great question. I I think I, I'll, I'll leave that for you and McLean to answer that question. <laughs> I, I you don't have I, the answer. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk further with, with who you know whoever, but 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 um, you first you first have to be interested in it. You first have to say that this is important to the institution and define why is it important to the institution, um, and then then you have to come up with a systematic plan. You understand, look at your data, look at your own data. To, to find out where the problems are, and then you can come up with a plan to start to address it. And including, you know, um, do you find value in having diversity on your staff and faculty? Um, is it important if it's, if it's, you know, or not? Maybe it's not important. You, you, have, to, you have to figure that out. Um, what, you know, certainly there's, there's plenty of strong data that shows a diverse faculty and staff really enriches the environment and and it's a better work, workplace and, and a whole bunch of things. But then also it's going to be better for patients and patients' experiences um, a, as well. Um, but it's, it's really up to the institution to decide and, um, um, and so on now. Um, but again, I, I, I'm sure you have, I know you have leaders in this area um, at your hospital. And um, I'm happy to uh, meet with them, provide other insights or, you know, just on our experience over here um, uh, but there's there's a lot that could be done and it could really help serve the greater Boston community um, and for the hospital to be a welcoming place and and you know even even looking at um, you know like one, one of the things that we've had to do in in, in, in October we'll be hope, opening up a psychiatric hospital in Brockton and we've been looking for years for the right place and we finally found the right spot and but simply because um, we have a hell of a time um, getting our patients into, into these, you know, um, um, hospital beds, psychiatric hospital beds around the city. Um, and, and people come up with, I, I love reviewing like why the patient was declined, come up with all sorts of excuses to decline our patients, even when they have beds open. Um, and, you know, so we, we you know, it, it was our fault that uh, like years ago, they got rid of their psychiatric inpatient unit, like 20 years ago, they, they made a mistake there, but, um, but, the, but, um, but we've been at the mercy of everybody else. Um, but it's really difficult to get our patients into all of these, you know, private hospitals and, and so on, and even general hospitals. Um, so, um, so that's something we, you know, the hospital said, okay, we're gonna lose several million dollars a year in doing this. But we have to do it because we have to better serve our patients because we, we're not getting the community. The community is not taking our patients in when we need them to. So, But yeah, to hear that you're going to lose several million dollars a year, that's going to drain resources further from the institution. And yeah, that's yeah. heartbreaking to hear. I just want to... Um, come back in and thank you so much for being here today, uh, Dr. Henderson, and for this talk, which is a really important talk. And clearly we have so much more work to do um, as a system and as a state, as a city, and as a society to 
um, bring together much better equity for all of our patients. And I really thank you so much for shining a light on some of the things that are really close to home here um, and for all of us to think together about how to make it better for all of our patients. And I really do appreciate everything that you said today. And um, as you know, I'm a great admirer and look forward to having more conversations with you um, about all of these issues. So I thank you very much. It's great. Thank you for having me again. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you all. all.